Greetings, film freaks. We are the Popcorn Kernels. Join us as we discuss the hard and often indigestible truths that are at the center of the fluffy and delicious world of cinema. What's poppin' people? Welcome to the Popcorn Kernels podcast. My name is Adam, and joining me in the air holes is Harry. Say hello, Harry. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, cinco, seis. When we started delivery of roast dinners, you don't need a gun like this, you need a gun like this. On today's episode, we will be talking about Flea. This is a 2021 documentary film directed by Jonas Poher Rasmussen. IMDb describes the synopsis as follows. Flea tells the extraordinary true story of a man, Amin on the verge of marriage, which compels him to reveal his hidden past for the first time. Here is an original song to support the synopsis. Imagine having to lie to survive Putting your faith in a stranger to try To stay alive The struggles of a refugee What on land, no choice but to Let's start with some facts about the film. Flea is reportedly the first film to be simultaneously eligible for consideration in the Oscar categories for animated feature, documentary feature and international feature film. Me like? You like? Yeah, I don't really understand the categories. I understand best foreign film or say uh, best documentary. Yeah, I don't and think animated be... feature. And animated, yeah. That's crazy, yeah, when you think about it like that. But it's not a full animation. It's inter- it's interspersed with true with real footage, archival footage, isn't it? That is a, a valid valid argument. Yeah. Like maybe there has to be a certain percentage of the film that is animated for it to qualify. Yeah, I'd say one hundred percent has to be yeah. animated. Yeah. I think that's that's really great accolade for such educational and harrowing piece of cinema to be Clever, nominated yeah. for those at the same time. Clever to have that much artwork going on that it can cover them different fields of accolades, didn't it? That's yeah. cool. I could be wrong, but I don't think it won any of those awards. Out of the three, animated feature, documentary feature and international feature film, which do you think it's most worthy of? Uh, it, was there a documentary on you said there? Yeah, documentary feature, animated feature or international film feature. Documentary feature, but I'd have to know also what else it was up against at mm. the time. Yeah. Like if there was uh, the act of killing or what's the whale one? Blackfish. Blackfish. They were excellent. Good contenders. I'm all in for it. Yeah. I think it speaks to the quality of the piece to even be considered in, in three categories. Yeah. yeah. The animation so, is amazing. Yeah. Because it doesn't it doesn't stay animated, mm. does it? It strikes a good balance between animation and real footage that it sort of relaxes you, doesn't it, with the, how, how nice it looks, the animation and stuff. It's very colourful. It's very vivid. It's, it's good to look at. It's got that Tintin palette. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, exactly like Tintin. And then when that real footage hits, it's like, whoa. Because mm. you, you're sort of lulled into a full sense of security when it's animated, aren't you? Yeah. And then when you see it, it's, boy, yeah, impactful. Bong Joon-ho, director of Parasite, listed Flea as one of his favourite films of 2021, calling it the most moving piece of cinema of the year. Mm. He's got great taste. Yeah. He also loved Mad Max, Fury Road. Well, exactly, yeah. yeah. I think I, I like I like my Mr. Joon-ho. Yeah, the man, Paras- Parasite was mecca. The man knows what he's uh, what he's talking about. And I, I, I'd agree with him. It, it certainly moved me, this film. I think the Oscar voters might have missed the trick for not pushing it forward to, to at least win one of those. It's weird, isn't it? 
because it's it's revered globally and by critics and everything. But it made a huge loss with money. It didn't make much money. It, I think it made eight hundred thousand dollars, and it cost three million to make. Yeah. So it's so strange when a film this so well received and so revered by the world, like Bon Joon Ho, for instance. Mm. If you saw this DVD on a shelf, it said five stars. Bon Joon Ho, one of the best things I've ever seen. That's a seller, isn't it? That's for me. Yeah. It's like, oh, I'm going to pick that up. Exactly. Yeah, strangely, it didn't win the awards. I always think they miss great opportunities, though, with who they should be putting their Oscars onto. It's, it feels now, even in this day and age, they still play it a bit too safe. I mean, mm. I know it was a, a huge steps of inclusivity when um, Parasite actually won Best Picture. That That's the first time, I believe, a... a, a film from yeah. world cinema has won best picture and not best foreign picture so they might taken steps in the right direction but i'd argue that flea didn't make money because it's not necessarily a film that would appeal to the masses i think it's your cinephiles your documentary fans people that are looking to educate mm. themselves not just digest a form of entertainment you've you've got to really be there for this sort of content haven't you it's a great blend of two like you said um it's great for people, you know, historians and people that are interested in all that, all that turmoil with the Middle East and also for film fans just about how it was uh, crafted and put together. Yes. The, the animating, the editing, the clever way that he manages to put a slow fuse on the story so you stick with it rather than straight out a uh, beheading or this yeah. or th- look at this shock 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 you slowly have to whittle down the pro- protagonist. That's it, yeah. It's an alias, isn't it? His name. He couldn't reveal his real name. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. 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 So and it's clever. So hit there that director realizing that by making it an animation, this guy could tell his story without getting yeah. reprimanded for A being homosexual, B being a refugee. Yeah. Yeah. So cool, man. I'd argue that um a film like this is actually more impactful because there's not any of like you say that those shocking elements you see in documentaries like this is a this is a refugee story and it is shocking what he goes through. Mm. But there's no real like depiction of of horrible violence or there's no like gut wrench all implied isn't it yeah and it's it's a horrible experience he goes through but it isn't lessened by like you say that shock factor of having a scene that that's just like oh i couldn't i had to look away i couldn't watch it so i think it strikes that balance quite well Mm -hmm. director jonas poher rasmussen initially conceived flea as a radio production then a short film combining live action and animation before finally settling on creating it as an animated documentary. I'm glad it's presented the way it is. Mm. I think it's it's more impactful with that animated element. I think it looks great. I, I love think, animation. Like you say, he's able to, to retain his... An- anonymity. Anonymity, yes, because it's, it's uh, animated, so you don't actually see him and he, he stops... He doesn't give his real name, so he's not mm. under any threat of the authorities f- of from Afghanistan where he, he fled from finding out where he is or who he is because he's from a culture that still, like you said, reprimands homosexuals, really yeah. outdated with their views and stuff. So he's able to tell his story without mm-hmm. falling victim to that. And I think it's it's really clever. It would be been interesting to hear this as a radio production, but I don't think it would have got the audience numbers in. No. Oh. I mean, you don't. It'd have to be marketed in a way where you could tune in, but that's kind of a uh, self-deprecating to say this, but it's kind of a dying format, isn't it? Yeah. To listen to like an incredible story like that deserves a big screen. That's it. All the animation, all the care and attention of a really artistic director who's also friends with the the subject matter. Yeah. Which was cool. I think uh, it would be asking a lot of an audience to tune in week in week out to listen to say it was in a podcast format. Because it is, it, I'm sure he's got enough story uh, with mm. his experience of being a refugee and, and fleeing and all the trials and tribulations that came with that. But to to have, I don't know, six to ten hours of, of just listening to that, I think it's far more impactful when it hits quicker and harder just seeing it in a neat, an hour and a half animated yeah. package. Well, otherwise it's, a, it's essentially an audiobook biography and that's what he should have just done. Mm. So doing it in this form allows his story to be uh, condensed and made more effective because of the visuals and throw it out there yeah and it hits it hits a bigger audience i mean for the likes of riz ahmed and um waldow i don't yeah. know how to pronounce his name nor do i Nic- jamie lannister yeah nicola costovaldal but uh, for the fact that them to be so moved by it to you know put their put themselves in the production role to try and assist the film get recognized get get uh, funding etc i think it shows that it was a powerful film and i um 
I heard that those those two, the big names that were producers of this film, they didn't actually take any money for, from it, yeah. which I respect because I think they looked at the story, Riz Ahmed's uh, heritage and Jamie Lannister He's being Danish. Danish. Yeah, they've both got like a connection to the story. Yeah. And I think them putting that connection front and centre rather than making any monetary gain mm. speaks to the quali- quality of the product. Well, I'd rather have my name at the front of this project because it's a very it's something to be proud of and it's also a great way to show awareness and show the struggle of what is still happening today with refugees. Yeah. You know, there's a thousand thousand kids a day that happens to and this one story is just him. It's just yeah. one guy who was luckier than most of them. So to have your name attached to it, why would you want any money in return? No. Amazing. It's a harrowing and humbling thought, isn't it? When you when you do think the amount of people that go through similar and I hate to say it, worse plights yeah. than I mean in this film. Well look at them the boats overturning from like Syria to you know Italy the channel and stuff it's people for the the human side is forgotten a lot of time because all they're looking at is they uh they're all just stealing our jobs they're exactly. immigrants but what they don't realize is like a four-year-old just drowned yeah in the channel and his body just washed God, up. That's, it's an awful thought isn't it it's terrible i yeah. think though those people those let's be honest brexiters yeah. who who have got their panties in a twist of refugees trying to find safety mm. i think if they watch this film it might change their mind a little bit not all brexiters but the brexiters that i knew personally it came from more of a racial and yeah. anti-immigration standpoint that they voted Brexit exactly. because they're lower class themselves. So having myself coming from lower class, so having an affiliation with with them, but when they started talking about that's why they're going to vote Conservative just to keep Brexit uh, alive because of the immigrants, because of the immigrants, I'm like, it's not going yeah. to solve it, immigration. It's almost an excuse for them to be racist, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And and it's so funny because it's done nothing. Their, their thought of you know getting out of Europe would stop immigrants. We I think 22,000 immigrants crossed the channel in 2022. Yeah. So it was their their reasoning for the Brexit part was it, it comes from a, a bitter place. Very funny though, because they, they need to learn their own history because the English empire was in Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan in like 18, 1800s. So we destabilized the Middle East. We deserve, we deserve refugees and we deserve immigrants because we, we need to start paying our part for the imperial colonies. And yeah. Stuff. Well, that's, I think it comes from a place of, of ignorance they oh, yeah. they look at the they see the 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 figures and the stats of refugees trying to find solace trying to come to a place where their life's not under threat they're not in danger and they just immediately think oh they're taking they're taking our jobs they're taking our homes all, all of this which is mm-hmm. just nonsense if you put anyone in the position of of living in a war environment of course you're going to do all you can mm-hmm. to get you and your family away from that conflict because of course you would. Yeah. You don't want to be living in an environment where you could be shot, blown up. Why would you not want to happen. help? Exactly. I, it baffles me. So I would implore those people that are anti-refugee to watch films like... Jeremy Kyle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, let's be honest. <laughs> those people. Majority of them would be on Jeremy Kyle. They would, yeah. Yeah. And it's sort of a very uneducated um, ignorance to it. But then you go to the other end of the spectrum... And it, you know you've got, the, you've got the rich, you've the got the affluent, yeah, the affluent who also were Brexiteers and wanted to get out of Europe, but for what reasons I could never tell you. I'm not educated no, enough. I don't think they know really. They've just got that sense of entitlement that yeah, it's not a good look. Yeah. What did you like about Flea? Being a documentary, I'd have to narrow it down to the actual particular scenes and parts of the story. Look, moved me. One scene that li- almost brought a tear to my eye because it was so effective and I wasn't expecting it. So obviously you follow the story of Amin from four or five years old, from when yeah. he's listening to Take On Me, Aha, uh-huh, in the streets of Kabul wearing a dress. Excellent imagery. Um, you follow him all the way up to preteen or like 14 years old, don't you? So he has two struggles, obviously. He's a he's a refugee from Afghanistan during the uh, civil war between the Afghan government and the Mujahideen. Mujahideen. Yeah. CIA and the US funded them to beat the Ruskies. Sort of like a reverse Vietnam. But what I thought was beautifully moving was he's got two struggles. He's an immigrant trying to get away from war-torn zones and trying to keep stay together with his family and he is the youngest but he um he also is homosexual and that's one of the hardest things in his culture not only has he say got to russia and escaped and he's trying to improve his life but the fact that he can't tell his family he's also homosexual so he's got two mountains to climb exactly yeah and one would be enough for a young mind to to deal with wouldn't it yeah once he does sort of achieve semi freedom, he gets he gets sent to Denmark, doesn't he, by traffickers? Yes. But his his oldest brother, who left years ago in Af- Afghanistan, he's he's been in Sweden. He's managed to get two sisters out. The fact that his uh, his older brother keeps saying, "Why haven't you met a pretty girl?" And they're not pretty girls in De- in uh, Denmark. 
Mm. He lashes out. I think he's, you know, he's gone through all of this hell and then he wants to be honest to himself. So he says to his brother, I don't like girls that way. Mm. And then there's this moment in the kitchen where both of his sisters turn and look at him and they go, you sure? Have you even been with a girl? And his older brother just goes, come with me. And I just naturally thought, oh God, he's going to take him to a whorehouse. You know what I did? Yeah. He's going to try and make him sleep with a woman because in their, obviously in that Afghan culture and stuff, you just think they don't believe in it. He thinks they're saying, and you know, I just thought he's going to make him sleep with a woman. And it's the the most touching scene ever, but it's a gay club and he gives him money and goes, go and have fun. We've always known that you don't like girls. It was beautiful. It was lovely, wasn't it? In an hour and a half of of you watching one individual's plight and him trying to navigate this crazy world when he's so young and then growing up and and having to to get over all these obstacles, the biggest internal one he had was revealing his truth, that he's he's gay. I'd say it's the bigger one. For for him, certainly, yeah. Especially when he's, he's part of a culture that is so unaccepting with it. Yeah. So and obviously was so fearful to let his family know. You know what? I'm 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 gay. It's, mm. it's who I am. And like you, that scene happens when he tells him that the brother's silent. He takes him. I'm like, oh god, he's going to make him sleep with a woman. How awful yeah. is that going to be for him? And in a film that is is gut wrenching and 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 just horrible. You expected for, the worst. Yeah, and the fact that they're so accepting, it was a lovely moment. Yeah, mm. that I'll be honest, that nearly got got me. I yeah. watched it twice and both times. The second time I knew it was coming and I still found myself with a lump in my throat. And how good did the club look? Like the music, the lights. Uh, finally, he felt accepted. You know, the barman winked at him. He saw people being able to be themselves. Yeah. And obviously being uh, Sweden or Denmark, much more forward thinking in um, in diversity and in sexuality and gender. A, yeah, a eureka moment in the film is brilliant. Imagine how freeing that must be going through your whole life being oppressed. Yeah. Like you can't, you're not allowed to just go and be a refugee and, and escape the conflicts because of all the politics involved in mm-hmm. that. You're scared to tell people who you really are because of the fear of backlash. Imagine that moment when your brother says, it's cool, man. I know, I know who you are. I don't mind. I love you mm. regardless. Whoever you are, I'll love you. Huge relief. And then that, that night must have been the most incredible night yeah. to have experienced, just to have that freedom in a life where he's had none. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. I always think back to, um, I saw an amazing documentary once called We Were Here, and it was about the, the AIDS epidemic in San Francisco. And it was so tragic how many young men whose families refused to speak to them because they were gay, but how many died alone in hospital beds because the ignorance of the family still didn't want to go and see their son, like a 23-year-old lad dying of AIDS in a hospital bed in the early days of that pandemic. And it's and it's, that's why it's so heartwarming to realise that his family accept him for it. Because it, it, imagine... You grow up with your family. Obviously, sexuality comes along with most people a lot later in their life. So prior to that, they are still children and they love their parents. They love their siblings. They still they grow no differently to heterosexual, bisexual. Of course, yeah. So imagine when sexuality becomes this weird blocker between you and your family's love all of a sudden. All of a sudden. So the fact that he, uh, he had that moment with his older brother I thought was really beautiful. Yeah. And it's true. And it wasn't, it wasn't a film. It wasn't fake. It was true. Yeah. And I think they pay respect to it by not making it like a huge over yeah. drama sized moment. Yeah. It wasn't like all all whistles and bells and everything, this huge moment. It was a very personal moment between him and his brother. Mm. And you can tell through um Amin's narration of it how how dearly he holds that moment, yeah. the way he's speaking about it in he retrospect. Laughed, didn't he? Yeah, it's, it's lovely, man. He goes, Beautiful. I went to my went to my first gay club. He goes, I didn't go. <laughs> yeah. It's great. You love to hear it, don't you? Oh. What else did you like about the film? As we spoke about earlier, there's archival footage of the Mujahideen and the and Moscow. Fuck, Moscow looks grim. Um, <laughs> yeah, it does. And I love how he didn't mind sharing that opinion of of Russians, or more specifically, the traffickers. But he goes, they're the worst people on earth. Yeah. And you just felt his anger. It was raw, wasn't it? Well, he pretty pretty much witnessed the rape of a girl by Russian police. He got, you know, they're so corrupt at the time. Probably still are, I'd say, most definitely. Yeah, so it's animated, interweaved with archival footage and animation. But at the end, there's this animated shot where he's finally decided to settle down with his other half, which he's been avoiding, ergo the, the title Flea. There's an unnatural inclination to keep running once you've been an immigrant. Well, yeah, he doesn't feel like he can be comfortable being still because his whole life has been, well, fleeing. He's been moving to place to place. He doesn't feel like he can just settle. Yeah, because I suppose it's not his home. No matter where he is, it's not not the Afghanistan he grew up in. 
No. Because believe it or not, there was a time where Afghanistan was, it wasn't like almost a religious, you know, a caliphate. It wasn't, it wasn't being controlled by, you know, you have to wear a hijab, you have to, yeah, it used to be actually a very free thinking country. It used to be a kingdom as well. So, you know, uh, women could go to school and et cetera. Then when it all changed, he can't even go back to the country he was born in. So I could, n I could never imagine that. Growing up no. in England, never have, never knowing what it would be like to be pushed out of it and never get to return. Amazing that he's uh, he's fleeing a lot. But yeah, I'll go back to the point. At the end, he's finally settled down with his boyfriend and made that decision to finally commit to a home, something he's never done. And uh, it's still animated. And his boyfriend goes, oh, look, there's uh, there's raspberries down here. I'll go show you them. It's really cool. There's that whole bushel of raspberries. And they step down the steps. And then it cuts to the real shot. Yeah. And it's it's... It's exactly what the animation was. It's not a copy. It's not a copy of the real shot. They they did animate originally by using footage, but it's the real shot, and that real shot implies that everything you've seen is real. Yeah, because they got it perfect with the animation. So that's a nice um, that's a nice sign off. Yeah, it it says everything you've seen here is real purely because I've just cut from animation to real. Yeah, it's a, a grounding moment, and those though, like you say, scattered throughout the film is that that real uh, footage, and that that makes the impact more hefty doesn't it and for both the more difficult moments and the more uplifting moments so at the end you see he's found peace he's found a place where he can he feels he can call it home with the man he loves mm. and you're seeing what he sees he's actual home he's actual abode he's he's actual outlook landscape and that's it's the lovely. first time you see real footage in the present yes every footage in the present is animated and all historic footage is archival yeah, and the at, only time at, you see real footage is that bit with the bush at the end. Yeah. Yeah, but you don't see him. No. Hmm. Yeah, it's a lovely point. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed that as well. Any more likes? Uh, I think it's all encompassed in what I've said. Yeah. Animation, because it's a true story. I mean, how can you critique, critique it? It's it's a tricky one, isn't it? Early doors, I had a, I was, I had a suspicion that I didn't understand why he was lying. Because he said, um, all my family were killed by the Mujahideen, my dad, my sister, my brother. And then quite early on, it's revealed that his sisters were alive. And in Sweden, I was like, hold on. Yeah. Why is he lying? And then patience, if you wait and hold out for it, it reveals it slowly as to why. Yeah. His burden is is not the the worst case scenario, I'd say, of, of him actually losing his family to, to violent terrorist attacks. But his burden is is a really hard one to tackle on your own because he has to maintain that lie to be able to continue living in a safer place as a refugee. Because mm. if he exposes, especially when he first went over he's to Denmark, minor, that he's, uh, yeah, that he's um, family all alive, they'll just ship him back yeah. because he's got people to look out yeah. for. If him. his mum's in Russia, they'll send yeah. him back. So, so he, he has to pretend they're dead. You pair that peril of being a, a young person in a completely foreign land, not knowing the language on your own, all of that history of trying to flee Afghanistan and, getting holed up in Russia and all the difficulties there and then having to try and start a new life by holding that burden of a secret within must be such a difficult thing to to deal with yeah yeah it's amazing that he uh, came out as well as he did yeah and you very know, level headed and apparently he's, um, the real person is extremely well known within the academia of the medical research that he's involved in yeah. so he's actually a very very well known person mm. maybe if, if you were clever you might actually be able to find his real identity but don't yeah, don't, yeah. I think there's a reason why he didn't want people to know. Exactly, yeah. Just hear his story and, yeah, just respect it. It was weird about the McDonald's in it. So you know uh, he's there for the grand opening of the first McDonald's in Moscow. Yeah. That was in the news not long ago, closing down because of the whole Russia conflict. Really? Yeah, closing mm down. No more Big Macs for the Ruskies. I just thought it was really weird because in the news it's really stood out because they showed footage in the 80s of it opening. Mm. And that's when I first saw it, like, a, you know, a few months back. And I thought, well, oh, that looks really weird. I never knew Moscow had a McDonald's. And it was, they showed its grand opening in the 80s, just after the Berlin Wall, I think. And then uh, and then it closing down because of the, obviously, the, the current conflict with Ukraine. And then uh, it appeared in the film and it, they captured it perfectly. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's weird. It's madness that... That, a that he saw it. Yeah, McDon McDonald's opening and closing is such a big story elsewhere where over yeah. here oh there's another mcdonald's is there okay cool yeah well it was, it was symbolic of uh the russians moving past the soviet union and trying to make ties with the u.s rather than have that whole cold war wasn't mm, it yeah so that mcdonald's standing in moscow is really symbolic yeah so it closing is another it's another message of returning back to that iron curtain yeah yeah and what i like most about the film was just how profoundly moving it was like you, your sentiments exactly. It's uh, flee is a harrowing insight into the plight of a refugee, 
And I, I found it to be a strong documentary feature film that is raw, powerful, but it's also like moving and, and brave as well. I admire him in, and the team for delivering a film that doesn't go the way you think it would. Now, I don't know if I've been conditioned to, to when you watch a documentary of, of this caliber to think, oh God, it's going to be, it's going to be just a horrible, horrible story. And don't get me wrong. There's parts of his life and his experience that are awful. Like you said, I can't comprehend the, the, the physical and emo emotional turmoil that man and his family have been through. I will never understand it. Mm. But at the start, when you hear that, when he says that he's lost all his family, I was expecting the worst. And I didn't think for one second that it would turn out that his family were all okay. Apart from dad. Yeah. Yeah, that that's sort of a given that his dad got taken fairly early doors between the in the conflict, and yeah. you thought you expected the worst. The Afghan government thought he was a communist. Yeah, so he was definitely killed, wasn't he? Yeah, and he disappeared, but they killed him. I think it's it's safe to say, yeah. Mm. But I think, as I say, you see documentaries like this, and you after ten twenty minutes, you're like you sort of brace yourself for the worst. But oddly, even though the worst doesn't happen in terms that his family is still alive, it still hits hard because he's had to pretend they're not, mm. which would still be a lot to deal with, right? Well, yeah, because he, he, well, I think when he first got to Denmark and say he'd made his freedom to a quite a, you know, democratic, westernized country, he had to be alone still for two, three years. He couldn't, yeah. couldn't contact really, he couldn't talk to anyone because he had to hide the fact that he does have family. Yeah. So that would have been, I can't even imagine what he got up to or like how he fed himself or did anything. I suppose he got a bit of help from the state, but how lonely. God, yeah. Amazing. But then again, what you've been through on the in the cargo hold of a ship in the bloody uh, Baltic Sea. Christ, can you imagine how terrifying that is? Mm. Like in a storm, icy cold water, your mum's there. You're just thinking, Christ, what's going to happen? I, I feel like the 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 story the the film it's a testament to to Amin's character to be able like you said to be able to come out at the end of this and still be respectable member of society intelligent mm. um, being able to accept love being able to give love be a, a well rounded person after all of this like that takes some deep inner strength man like full respect how did he get ahead in life in terms of education with such a uh, hiatus of uh, like education and normality. Well, in the uh, the film itself, I guess he he says there was this this sense of almost burden that he had to pay back what his yes. family done for him. Yeah, because obviously they had to save money to be able to flee at first Afghanistan, then Russia. That's why he puts did it. relationships and on the back burner. Exactly. Yeah, he's yeah. he's fully committed to to paying paying family back by his success by being an upstanding civilian by being someone that they're proud of and. They must be. Yeah, he said he owes, owes his siblings the world, doesn't he? Yeah. That's sad, man. It is. What a heart. Mm. Uh, my, my second like is is just how important I consider uh, documentaries and, and films like this to be. I consider this more educational than uh, entertaining. And the film shows us the importance of hearing the insights from all perspectives of war. It made me realise how lucky I have been and how lucky I am to live the life that I have. Mm -hmm. Now, all too often, um, refugees, uh, particularly in uh, English media, they they can be villainised. Yeah. There are there's more people coming over, like and you get the, like we mentioned earlier, the Brexiters, the ignorant racists that are mm -hmm. up in arms about it. But you listen to their stories, and like you said, this man, this man's story is one of millions that have gone through similar or worse experiences. Like, it's important that these voices are heard. Mm -hmm. I really think that, and I think more people should open up their mind and 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 absorb it the power of documentaries love it the, certainly the two um the companion pieces i absolutely adore i think you've seen one of them act of killing and the look of silence about the indonesian genocide with uh, communism that's really brave because one of the protagonists one of the people who actually suffered at the hands of the genocide puts himself on camera changes his name but he does put himself on camera and that was a uh, that was really powerful and flees up there with these i think most definitely, especially because there's that there's that uh, storyline running right alongside it with the coming out of the closet. Yeah. So that's like two huge, huge things that he's dealing with. I mean, what else could you have put in there to make it even harder for him? Oh, God knows. Mad. That's it's humbling. Mad. Very humbling, isn't it? Uh, my final like is, is again, it's, it, it mirrors yours and the animation itself. It's beautifully strong imagery and it's a really interesting way to, to present Flea. 
it manages to both soften the blow and heighten the peril with a really striking uh, animation style that helps Amin tell a really difficult story. I think it's a fascinating story. It's an educating story. It's an eye-opening story. But it would, I would argue, if it was just um, floating head type documentary where people are talking to the camera, maybe he's he's a silhouette, so he doesn't reveal his identity. It would have, I don't know, it wouldn't have that. I would flourish might be the word of a wrong word, but the fact it's animated and it looks so nice, it it makes the piece feel more like a film than a documentary. I don't know if you agree. Yeah, you could have the most highly realistic acting voice acting in it, almost like real life uh, mockumentaries couldn't you yeah you throw an animation on it it is a film but because it's real people talking in real moment the animation gives it the film yeah. effect if you were just watching someone talk and there was a recreations then it's that belongs that belongs on telly doesn't it it's, it's a it's a documentary on at 5 p.m yes so having a having the animation aspect allows it to be a film i think i agree with you in that sense yeah definitely is there anything you didn't like about flea Maybe I, I might have wanted to have seen more archival footage of the terror they were fleeing mm. with the Mujahideen and the the, con, the constant changing of governments and the Russian involvement because it was obviously it was terrible. But I think they managed to get out quite quickly before it got really bad. Um, yeah, because the Mujahideen ended up being Al Qaeda in the end. Well, Al Qaeda the terrorist group, but it ended up being the Taliban. You know, so um, what the, what he left behind only ever got worse. Yeah, you know, public beheadings in football stadiums and stuff like just out of stoning of women so um maybe to just show what he left behind a bit more so i probably wanted i might i might have personally wanted a bit more shock but then again that wasn't his story yeah that's a that's a good point to round that 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 off with isn't it because it is a personal story rather than the bigger picture Mm. but i I think it would have been interesting to to have, have gained more context at the the wider the bigger scale of things yeah i'd I'd agree with that Yeah, because you didn't really see much of the tyranny in his homeland you saw it a lot more in the russia in russia but then again being older he 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 took that one on a bit more didn't he Mm. so god i just i think that was the worst part for me was that it was watching him their their struggle in russia i just thought it's a bleak place anyway Mm. and imagine being having it's not your home and you're being persecuted every single day and the police are so bloody bent Mm. imagine being young escaping all of that and just still having people using you yeah. not, not helping you not cuddling you you know it's, it's insane yeah, yeah. it's, it's hard it is hard to find a dislike for it but maybe the pacing in bits like well just as he's about to start revealing stuff he then steps back and goes oh, i'm not ready yeah and i'm like oh come on yeah you know, you know when someone goes oh i need to tell you something oh, but i can't yet yeah like, no yeah you've you've drawn me in now i'm interested tell yeah. me more yeah yeah hit me i think that just i think that's a, a decision in the filmmaking process to just show you how difficult he found found it all and mm. t- to relate to that but yeah certainly it draws you in and then he's he's almost reluctant because he's been holding that secret and that burden in for so long it must have been tough to to share it right mm. Yeah, I'll go on to my um, dislikes. Like you, I I struggle to find anything. It's hard to to decipher a documentary like this and think, oh, I didn't in, I didn't like this because you're not you're not enjoying this. You're you're like I said, you're educating yourself. You're broadening your horizons. You're you're gaining a better it. understanding. So to to nitpick seems a little bit hmm. distasteful. But I guess an element I. I did dislike, I'd say, it is a difficult watch. And whilst I applaud the bravery and efforts of everyone involved with Flea, it is at its core a difficult to digest documentary. The film touches on subjects like war, racism, homophobia, uh, human trafficking, and it's a continuously harrowing insight into one refugee's tumultuous life. Mm. And I'd say if if you are, if you're particularly sensitive, if, if you don't enjoy watching tough documentaries maybe this isn't something for you if if you'd prefer to consume content that's whimsical and and light-hearted and fun then i would suggest you steer clear of of fleas mm. but equally i think it's important to well it's told to like watch. a story isn't it through yeah. the animation so it's uh it's not as harrowing i suppose as something with um the real footage of you know war crimes etc mm. you can keep your eyes on the screen for the whole film you never have to look away and on a couple of occasions, you think you're going to have to look away. I thought when they were in their first attempt to escape, they were carrying um, 
an older woman in the woods, wouldn't they, in the cold? And, yeah, the, yeah. and the Russian guys that's just put a bullet in her head. I thought and that I was going to happen. Yeah, I thought they were going to kill the old woman. And of, even in, as an animation, you'd know that that was real. So you can keep your eyes on the film the whole time, but it's what plays on your mind after and during. Yes, like, certainly. You think of your own, you'll think of your own mum in this, you'll think of your own brothers and sisters, and you'll put yourself in his shoes, and that's the harder one to uh, to swallow. Definitely. Yeah, I totally agree. And uh, the other thing I struggled with, again, it's not necessarily a dislike, but for the purpose of the podcast, it was just the harrowing film footage. Flea is clever at disarming the audience with the visually stunning animation, but throughout the film, clips of real wartime footage are weaved into it and the impact of these true recordings, it feels greater when you don't expect it. Mm. And I found it added to the difficulty of, of the viewing. It's cleverly made, but but difficult to digest. You do see a couple of dead bodies, don't you? Yeah, there's there's one in particular that, that sort of hit me like a ton of bricks. is uh, someone falling down a slope a, a pavement slope and he's been shot yeah. and you see him sort of slide down and then almost like the the foot of, of the slope accepting mm. it like covered in blood and it was just the the beautiful animation and and the more joyous moments of the film sort of distracts you and then when those parts come in it it hits mm. it hits different and you're like oh, you almost can't yeah. can't look away no you can't yeah yeah I've got some questions. Mm. I think Flea is an important film. Do you think it should be shown in schools as an educational tool or does the narrow-mindedness of some parents mean it would cause too much controversy? Well, if the parents watched it too, I'd just find it hard. They'd, they'd be the one of the worst people on earth if they watched that and didn't feel for the people, yeah. the struggle that these guys are going through. But unfortunately, those people that because of, of their prejudice against refugee and particularly that part of the world mm-hmm. wouldn't even wouldn't even watch it. And I could see if if they've if there are parents out there, if they heard their child be showing this, I'm not talking young children, mm-hmm. I'm talking in sick form and stuff like that, watching films like this to better educate, to to broaden those horizons. I think there are parents out there that would be in uproar, which so is a damn shame. I've always used this to disarm ignorance. It could be in a pub, it could be it could be a, a, a distant relative and they've got ignorant views. I always disarm them of this. So I ask them, who do you love the most? Like, who, who's dearest to you? Like, I'll ask you now, who's dearest to you? partner mum doesn't matter does it they're all dear to you right you're with them on a on a platform train station now a kid uh, a kid accidentally on his bike knocks your loved one onto the tracks and a train's coming yeah and you're standing there you can't get down to her but then an african man jumps down a ukrainian man jumps down or an iranian man jumps down and they save that person's life and pull them up onto the track and then they get hit by the train are you telling me after that you're still going to walk away with your ignorance about whatever well, nationality of that guy that jumped down, saved your mum's life, saved your wife's life, then got hit by a train and died. Are you still going to walk away and teach your kids to be a racist fucker? Well, you would you would hope not. And I don't understand the mentality of racists or or bigots or or homophobes. I, I don't understand that mentality that they're they've, they're so full of hate that they they disregard these groups of people mm. but i would struggle to believe that any racist or a- any bigot in that situation surely not no surely way. they wouldn't they wouldn't be like no way um can you put my mum back on the track please i don't agree with no your way. skin color yeah. it's ridiculous that's how quickly and that is one of the best questions you could ever ask someone that's ignorant and you know what the ones that would say no i wouldn't change my opinion about them they're lying. Uh, they deserve to be on the track. And they think they think they're putting on this facade of being hard and being mm. et cetera, et cetera. Arseholes. Yeah, yeah. Every time I watch a documentary, it inspires me to watch more. What is your favourite documentary and why? It used to be Grizzly Man because it's mad. The Werner Herzog documentary. Because it was so it was such an odd documentary. Blackfish is up there. Uh, actor killing look of silence it's um it's a hard one maybe the thin blue line's excellent about a wrongful imprisonment west of memphis that's excellent because i i think it's safe to say your your knowledge of document uh documentaries, documentaries. are far more superior to mine mm. and the the documentaries i have seen tend to be ones that you recommend sugar man sugar man's probably my favorite What's that one about? That's about Shikdo Rodriguez. He was uh, he was the the Elvis equivalent in South Africa during apartheid, but he was this 
poor, almost homeless musician in Detroit in the freezing cold, living alone. Everyone thought he was dead in South Africa. And he, at the time, he was like he was like the flag of uh, standing up against apartheid. So he had no idea how successful he was. He's bigger than Elvis in South Africa, but living wow. in a slum in Detroit. Yeah. And um, someone from South Africa, a documentary maker, um, went looking for him because he wanted to find out how he died. There was even rumours that he set fire to himself on stage. Bloody hell. Yeah. And uh, anyway, he sends out like this this like mark this message about Shikto. Uh, did anyone know where he lived or anything? And he's, it, Shikto's real daughter messaged him and went, my dad's not dead, he's alive. So they go out to find him and then they bring him back to South Africa and he puts on a gig to, you know, four, five, four or 5,000 people That's singing amazing. his songs, yeah. which he never even knew. They wow. knew. Yeah, so Sugar Man's probably, yeah, probably my favourite. See, I, kn- I know you've um, spoken to me about that one before and I, I do want to check that one out. Mm. So that would be the one Music. that you would... That would be the oh. one that you would offer as a suggestion to others that are looking to to yeah. expand on their yeah documentaries. Because it's uh that's that's probably one of the most incredible underdog stories you could ever watch, and it it doesn't hurt at all that he's he's one of the best songwriters probably ever. Really? Yeah, he was he was around the time of Bob Dylan, and he did Bob Dylan better than Bob Dylan. Okay. He, he amazing song, very heartbreaking, but uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful film. Yeah, I'll be sure to check that one out. Final question: uh, Watching Flea really hit home that behind every refugee is a story of struggle and desperation. Would you like to see more documentary films about the extraordinary journeys of ordinary people? Always, yeah, yeah. I think if when it's real, I think any film that starts with these are based on true events or this is a true story, it only adds and and help support that film mm. because you're invested in in the true story, aren't you? You're, it's, it's like, God, did that actually happen? You find yourself looking, did that actually happen? Yeah. Which uh, I think is very important to tell true stories. Yeah, me too, man, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, what would you rate Flea out of 10? I'd give it, um, and I'm basing this on other documentaries which I found more powerful, uh, more effective. I was going to say eight. Yeah. Yeah. It's only based on where I've I felt that the person revealing the their own identity at their the risk of their own skin it was was ballsy. I'm not discrediting him for not doing it because he had other reasons. But I think I've, you know, look of silence certainly for one. The shock factor of it and the and uh, the risks that the guys taking in it are uh, shocking because he goes back yeah. to where it happened and mm. confronts the people that did it. Yeah. So he's still a target. So uh, yeah, eight based on other documentaries. <laughs> yeah. I think you have to rate um, a film like Flea yeah, and documentaries differently to how you would rate, yeah. rate uh, an actual feature length mm-hmm. film, a blockbuster or an indie film. It needs to be a different sort of, of because, scale of rating because it is a true story. And it's, it's cool, yeah. And you're not you're not watching it to be entertained like you'd watch uh, a huge blockbuster or, or or to be sort of shocked by uh, stories that haven't actually happened with in the branch of, of shock cinema or indie films or quirky cinema, all of that. So you have to rate it differently. And I, I'd go with your score as well. I'd give it an 8 out of 10 for, for all of those reasons. Ba-boom! So that... That gives Flea a total score of 16 out of 20. So yeah. you should definitely check it out. If you value education over entertainment when it comes to documentaries, or if you like to be humbled by how difficult life as a refugee can be, then Flea could be a film for you. Consider watching this one if you enjoyed Waltz with Bashir, Persopolis, and I Lost My Body. Should we play a game? Si, sí, senor. The game in question is What the Plot, where the rules are simple and the results quite the opposite. Harry will conceive an original idea from his big and beautiful brain and give birth to a plot. It is then down to me to nurture this thought by providing a film title, genre, cast and anything else I can think of to raise this brainchild into a fully functioning film concept. Over to you Harry. I had to write a bit down for this one because you might be able to tell that I'm a bit heavy breathed today. Okay. Because I'm building up a nice cold. Oh okay. So I wrote a little down. That's good. Okay. Preparation is key. Not always. Okay. I do like improv. I think it can uh, it can weave gold. Yep. Occasionally. Yep. Hit me. Unless it involves hats or missing legs. Yes. We follow the story of John Ridgeback, a loner throughout his adult life. Although warm and kind and sharing, he, he shares none of his uh, sadistic peculiarities that his dad did. Um, well, it, I'm intrigued now. What was his dad? Well, you'll yeah, find out. Okay. Um, he, so he struggles to maintain friendships or romances because he can't talk about his past. So through fear of being rejected or misjudged, 
so he, he he can't reveal anything hence why nothing really works out for him but through flashback we're going to see the strange experiences in his childhood like uh, his father picking up women in the street finding blood inside his dad's van and eventually it's revealed that his his dad was the notorious red light ripper serial killer who murdered 30 prostitutes and now he's obviously he's dead or in prison he's gone but this kid's grown up knowing that that was his dad and he's got to hide his name he's got to hide his identity essentially you could you could even liken it to the real uh, gary ridgeway <laughs> John Ridgeback. I didn't even plan that. So John Ridgeback's the character's name, right? So Gary Ridgeway was the Green River Killer. Okay. Killed like 50 prostitutes. Right. Um, and he had a son, actually. So maybe I have been watching too many documentaries. Yeah. So uh, how do you move on with your life? How do you ditch that part of your life knowing that your dad was a, was a notorious serial killer? And you were, you were even in the van, like when he picked the woman up and uh, he'd say, oh, go and play with your bike. And in that time, he'd murder someone and you'd come back to the van and stuff. Like he grew up with all of these weird memories. So in the film, we see, you know, it starts with the loner, the guy in his adult life, having a very difficult time socializing, talking with people, building romances. Yeah. But then through flashback, you see why. And so I suppose it would culminate into the end of first time trying to tell someone he really cares about what actually happened and who his dad was. Because okay. who would stick around? If you told someone your dad was the red light ripper, they're never going to look at you and think, God, it, he's, he's fine, he's normal. They're going to think he could do it as so, well. I, look, I go on Wikipedia. Oh my God, his dad did this, he did that. So has the, um, has the son managed to attain anonymity? So the, it's not common knowledge that his dad is the, the red light ripper. Well, he's a minor, so... Well, when, he, when it was found out he was a minor, but now he's an adult. Well, yeah, so they, they would have moved life. them probably and okay. changed their name. Even if they didn't, he would have done it himself. You you can legally change your name past a certain age, can't you? Yeah. You, you, every day you're living a lie. Because say, say it happened to him when he was nine, but now he's 30 and he's in a bar and a girl shows him attention. He dates her for a few. And then she goes, I want to meet your family. And goes, oh, they died. She goes, oh, what did yeah. your dad die of? Like, I, I, how, how much will the lies just start rolling off his tongue? And if he tells her the truth, she's going to be like, oh, no chance. I guess similarly to Amin in um, Flea, he's holding this burden within yeah. himself. And I guess that, like, if if throughout his life he's trying to come to terms with this, mm. um, he's he's had to keep people at an arm's length. Because, of course, when you meet someone, through the evolution of the relationship, you talk about the past, the family, and all of that stuff, it'd be a very, uh, very difficult thing to to open up about. Well, this is someone else's shame, though, isn't it? Yeah. So it's even stranger, because it's not actually his actions, but he's suffering the consequences of his dad's actions. Yeah. It's I, like being Hitler's last surviving relative, isn't it? Yeah. So I'm thinking as part of this story to try and find some closure. Maybe he's the, the red light ripper is yeah. still alive. Maybe to try and find some closure. He, he goes to visit his dad. He hasn't visited him all the time. He's been in prison, but mm. he, because he's, he's, he's a warm, good guy at his core, the son and he, to be able to move forward and, and allow love in, he's got to sort of, mm. uh, to, to sort of visit that part of his life. Who could, It'd be very difficult, but um, so I, I could I would see this as a as being a, a son trying to come to terms with the the crimes of his father by mm. sort of tackling it head head on and dealing with that closure. And I wouldn't ever within the film I'd never see it as him gaining closure, never getting close to his dad. I would have his dad as this ab abhorrent, this monster. Liar, still now, just yeah, he 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 still sees himself as the victim. He's really aggressive, really nasty to his son. And the film sees the son going to see the dad on numerous numerous occasions to try to get the bottom of it, better understanding, so he can move forward with his life. So that's a really interesting story. Mm -hmm. uh, to in, in summary, it's the story of John Ridgeback. He's a, a loner, but a, a warm individual, good soul, well intentioned, but he struggles with relationships because of his murky past. In his past, the reveals that his dad is the notorious red light ripper who, thirty years ago picked up women and yeah. savagely killed them. Yeah. Serial killer who's been caught. And the story revolves around John Ridgeback trying to get over his past, better understand it and and try to move on with his life. Yeah. So directing this, this is a, a, a dramatic film, but I think that you'd need a, it's a, it's a taut and tense environment that, that 
I think you could really drive up the anxiety. So when he goes back to see his dad, his mm-hmm. dad could be so cold that you as the audience have got to feel that that mm. that horrible, anxious rush of his dad still being a monster. So I would have the Safdie brothers yeah. directing yeah. Who, yeah. Who, are, who are making their name in this really niche world of anxiety induced mm. filmmaking you, oh god yeah you look at good time and uncut gems like, bum, 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 yeah, that gets the heart beating so i would put a son being exposed to to his dad and the menace of his dad and having to deal with that could really be a uh, each meeting with him is is more ang- anxious mm. anxiety inducing than than the last and playing uh, john ridgeback the the son i'd go Ev- evan peters who was recently Jeffrey Dahmer in Dahmer. Yes. Just to flip it. Yeah. Because after playing such an iconic killer. Just give him dark hair and he'll be fine. Yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah. Change him up a bit. He's so a great he actor. Look, so, yeah. So I, I think it'd be interesting for him to distance himself from being the the villain to being almost the victim. And I think he's a very talented younger actor who's who's going to have big things away and he's, he's going to be great. Who's he? the flashback actor? The younger Ridgeback? Oh, I, I'd be almost tempted to just it be an up and coming someone that we don't know. Yes. Just so it, it's not taking anything away from, from the actual story. Yes, okay. And also, cause I can't think of anyone off the top of my head. Of That's the main reason. So yeah, I'd have uh, Evan Peters as um, John Ridgeback and then his dad, I'd have John Goodman. Oh, the Gooders. Yeah. Imagine him. Bigger, larger than life. And, and he's found a new, a new lease of life where he's getting these more, these, these, Mm. more substantial roles i could see him being really he could play he could play crazy yeah mm. and he's got to he's still got that hold over his son of being this in, intimidating presence and to have that there's no good him being like a, a whittled frail figure john john goodman's big and he? yeah, he's, he's tall dude. he's a large dude and he's got that big booming voice so the son could still be threatened by him and mm. i think he could be a real menace and the the interactions between father and son in in the prison cell could be really interesting I could see them two being father and son in yeah. an intense prison scene. Yeah. So Safety Brothers at the helm, Evan Peters as the son John Ridgeback, and John Goodman as the Red Light Ripper. And I'd call the film Red Light, Green Light. Breaking news. The notorious Red Light Killer has been convicted for the brutal murders of 30 women in the Deep Bay area. The judge handed down a sentence of life imprisonment with no chance of parole. What the fuck are you doing here? I want closure, Dad. I haven't been able to start my life because of what you've done. You haven't come to see me in 20 years. You left your poor dad to rot in prison and now now what? Wanna, wanna hear about what Daddy did? I need to understand. I can't form a relationship because I can't get over my past. I need to move on, Dad. That's bullshit. You got the bug, haven't you, boy? You wanna be like your dad, huh? You, you get hard at the thought of killing two, son? What? No. My therapist says I need to confront my past so I can start my future. She says I have to speak to you. She? What does she look like? The new film from the Safdie Brothers, starring Evan Peters and John Goodman. Red Light, Green Light, coming soon. <laughs>